Ladies and gentlemen, joining me on the line, the host of our new night show here on the station. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Gorman. What's going on, Steve? How you doing? I am well, as far as I know. Um, <laughs> you know, generally, if there's something on fire somewhere, somebody will let me know. And right now, my phone is quiet, so it's all good. Well, that's always a good sign of what's going on in the world around us. But, uh, Steve, you're a new night guy here on the station. Uh, that's what they tell me. Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> thrilled to be. And it's the fourth anniversary of the launch of this show, in fact, is, uh, is the night we launch on KGGO. So it's perfect timing, as far as I can tell. And it is Steve Gorman Rocks, and uh, your co-host is April. Mm -hmm. Put together a really good show. We're going to talk about it a little bit. And we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of uh, how you gotten into this world of radio. Because I think the, the Black Crow stuff is out there, obviously. You know, it's been covered. But I, how did you get into radio? Let's, go, let's start there. That was plan A, actually. I was a broadcasting major in college at uh, Western Kentucky back in the 80s. And uh, my, my thinking at 19 or 20 years old, was I really want to be in a band, but that's probably not going to happen. So I guess I'll be a sportscaster instead. Being a drummer in a band was the the, the principal goal from the age of five, but yeah. I just hadn't met the right people. And I, I didn't want to be a drummer. I wanted to be a drummer in a band. So it had to be with the right people. You know, I was kind of limiting my options by not <laughs> finding the right guys. Um, you know, I was, you know, they say beggars can't be choosers. Well, trust me, this was a choosy beggar here. I was like, it's got to be the right thing. I, I love like U2 and REM originally in the early, when they were first starting, and the whole point was they were bands. They were just like a gang. You know, that's what I was looking for. So in Kentucky, I couldn't find enough like-minded people that I wanted to play music with. But I also, in the back of my mind, was like, you know, I'd love to be a sportscaster because I was a jock. I grew up playing basketball and soccer pretty obsessively had a good voice love sports you know it makes yeah. sense so that was always like uh, the, the first plan was uh, be a sportscaster and I figured I'd probably be one of those guys who had a band on weekends or something <laughs> um, and then and then when I got to college I actually started playing drums a little bit instead of thinking about it yeah and pretty quickly was like man I know I really got to do this it was kind of it turned into I was denying what my gut was telling me and thinking I got to be responsible and get a degree and be a broadcaster. And then one day, as it turned out, a buddy of mine, a high school buddy had moved to Atlanta and he called me out of the blue. I was a senior in college and he said, hey, you're drumming, right? Do you want to start a band? And that was it. I said, yes, let's go. And I dropped out and immediately moved to Atlanta. His roommate was Chris Robinson. The first guy I meet when I moved to town. Next thing you know, I'm in a band that later would become the Black Crows and broadcasting just faded in my memory immediately. Well, along the way, Sports Talk Radio blew up by the late 90s, and I was listening, and I was always thinking, man, that would be a great way to still do, you know, kind of, not, I wasn't even thinking about it in terms of broadcasting. I just yeah. thought it was a creative, fun thing. And I moved to Nashville in 2004, started sitting in with the local guys on Sports Talk. I met them at preschool drop-off in the morning, as you do. No, you have really? Kids, you're, yeah. Oh, that's yeah, great. Yeah, my daughter. My daughter's best friend was the daughter of a guy that had the afternoon sports talk show in town, the biggest show. And so we started, you know, chatting and he says, oh, come in, sit in for a while. So I would sit in with him. And then one day the program director said, hey, you're really good at this. We should get you on once a week and get you a sponsor. And my response, which I had never thought of, I said, I'd rather just have my own show. And he goes, what do you mean? What would it be? And I said, I said, I want to do a show where it's musicians talking about sports. And in Nashville, Tennessee, that's not a bizarre concept, apparently, because about three nights later, on a Sunday night, I started Steve Gorman Sports for the first time. And I was way in over my head. I've never felt more, oh, what did I just talk myself into? <laughs> that but, you know, it took off because I know a lot of musicians that like sports, and it was kind of the general vibe was sports and music. Those are my only concerns in life. You know, I grew up with two... I had two things on mine, sports and music. That was it. Just who's your favorite band? Who's your favorite team? Let's argue. Let's get along. It was everything in my social life was around those two worlds. And so that turned into a local show on a regular basis. By, in 2011, I started doing it five days a week. And then in 2014, Fox Sports Radio hired me and put me nationwide. And it's just been a bit of a blur ever since. So you were a little bit ahead of a curve because, you know, you have so many musicians or athletes that are, you know, starting podcasts or moving into the world mm -hmm. of radio. Now, you were really ahead of the curve at the time. Yeah. And in fact, I did a podcast for a while, too. In 2009 and 10, uh, we were doing a podcast called Steve Gorman Sports without any idea what we were even doing. 
and it did really well. It was in the iTunes. It was a top 20 download of podcast every week in sports without any promotion or any even having a clue. And then I remember in 2011 thinking, I think I missed the podcast boat. I think I'll go back into radio. Might have been a mistake <laughs> to drop that podcast. Well, might have worked out, but um, but I wanted to do daily sports talk, and so that's what happened, and it's been pretty good ever since. Steve Gorman from Steve Gorman Rocks on the line with me right now as we talk about the world of radio and his show and just the history of radio you have. I didn't know you had that big of a history in radio because I, I always find that stuff interesting of how people kind of stumble into this world. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I definitely came in the side door. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was already in my 40s and I started doing just a show on Sunday nights nobody was listening to. But, you know, I did have a great guest list, like right away, just because of, you know, at that point, the Black Crows have been around almost 20 years. Yeah. You know, I, I had a local show on a Sunday night in Nashville, but I could have, you know, I'd get Chad Smith to call or Rich Eisen or any, you know, people yeah, yeah, from the yeah. world of music and sports. You know, I could get any number of people from Nashville. Um, so it was, I, I got a lot of attention, probably more than I deserved at first because I didn't know what I was doing, but I took to it. And by the time Fox Sports Radio picked me up in January of 14, you know, I had a pretty good idea. I, and again, I was well in over my head for a nationally syndicated show, but we figured it out in a few months. And we had a five-year run there that was that was fantastic. Um, when that show ended, when they wanted to go in a different direction, I was, I've never been happier to be relieved of a job in my life because it was exhausting. Like, yeah. man, every day having to keep up with so much information and we were having fun and we were by design a very left of center or right of center, just not down the middle sports show. We were trying to get as weird as we could, but it was a tiring thing. And that, that show ran its course. And then I took a year off and right away when Steve Gorman sports ended, I had people call from several different places saying, what about a classic rock show? Like you're a natural for that. Do you want to do something out of the world of sports? And I wouldn't have been interested in that when I was still with the Black Crows. That was just too. It was. It would be weird to be It'd in a be band work. and still be and, and talking about rock radio and you know playing my own band's music and what do I say about other bands? You know, it's just a weird. I just never thought it would make sense. Five years removed from the Black Crows, I was like, oh no, I could totally see that. That's kind of be the best of both worlds. And so Steve Gorman Rocks launched in the fall of '19. Like I said, next week will be our fourth anniversary right when we hit the ground with KGGO. So that's been going. And, of course, it was a really bizarre thing to be six months into a new show and then COVID hit, you know, and then it was suddenly, um, okay, you're going to go home and do the show from there. And I'm literally the most tech illiterate person on earth. And I thought, well, that'll be a neat trick since I barely know how to use a laptop. But we figured it out. There you go. Steve Gorman on the line with me right now. Hey, go back to uh, when you started uh, the, the show down in Nashville. And the name Steve Gorman is going to carry some weight. Did you have a mentor down there? Was there someone like, hey, you might want to rethink how you're doing it? Because you were saying you're figuring this out and stuff. Did you have the PD that uh, was a mentor or that kind of came down on you or you know, made you learn more about the world of radio? You know, initially, no, but in a good way. I, I got some tips. The PD that first put me on the air, a guy named Scott Willis, great guy. He he was very hands-off, but it, I, if I asked him, he'd give me plenty of notes. But because it wasn't a full-time show, yeah, I think he kind of wanted to steer clear. He was a little, like, nervous probably to give me notes, I think, at first. Um, when I started doing it nightly, I, I changed stations to a, sh a station that had just switched over to sports and the PD, who's still a, a, a good friend of mine, he was more of a rock guy. We talked a few times, but I kind of let it be known, like, look, I, I'm not ready for coaching yet. I still got to, I, I, I could kind of tell when things worked. I could tell when they didn't. And for a variety of reasons, mostly because he was just too busy trying to save a station and, and operate two stations at once. Uh, it wasn't really hands-on. Now, when I started, when the when the guy from Fox Sports Radio first called me, his name is Bruce Gilbert, and he's with Westwood One now, still yeah, part yeah. of the Westwood One Cumulus world. Bruce was the first guy that I just immediately took to. Like he was my rabbi. Like he would he was listening to my local show uh, in Nashville and would send me laundry list of notes, which I'd never really gotten. <laughs> and I was and I think I was finally at a place where I could receive notes. It, with the right headspace and before he'd even hired me he was coaching me 
And then once he did hire me, he coached me like crazy and gave me so much great information. And, you know, it's, it's not that I didn't need coaching before, but honestly, I just, I just, it, it wasn't like serious enough. I, I think I was still, I'm a drummer who's doing this thing on the side and it didn't feel that serious. But once, once a guy from a network called and said, hey, I think I might syndicate you on 200 stations, I was like, well, in that case, you better help me out because that's a big leap, and that's, that's how it worked out. Steve Gorman on the line with me right now. What's the best piece of radio advice you ever got? In terms of when interviewing people, it was any question that's over 10 words is too long. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> don't, you, you know, I would, I would set up a question for, you know, like I have a member of the Tennessee Titans on or a guy for the Atlanta Hawks, you know, a current athlete. And I had a subconscious desire to let, make sure they knew that I knew what I was talking about. So I would sabotage my own questions by answering it ahead of time and not letting the guest, you know, you bring a guy on your show for them to talk and I would over talk and I, and I didn't even realize it. The first time I heard an air check where someone said, stop trying to impress me with what you know, the listener wants to hear the guest. It was really like, oh, you know, I, I, a lot of stuff in radio, as you know, I compare it to dog training, which when someone shows you a piece of dog training, it makes perfect sense, but you would never figure it out on your own. You know, it's like, yeah. oh yeah, of course, naturally, I get that. But someone has to show it to you. And, and I felt like in this, of course, in this analogy, I would be the dog. And then I'm like, oh, that's right. This is how this works. I really changed my outlook on radio after watching uh, Jerry Seinfeld's uh, riding in cars with comedians. He mm -hmm. we, he kept talking about the comedy world as a craft, as something you have to learn, right. something you have to do and stuff. And I got to thinking about, I'm like, wow, that's radio in a nutshell. You have to learn to fail. You have to learn what works, what doesn't work, and so on and so forth. Well, you, it really is like anything else. You, you have to, you can be really talented. It's just like the world of music. I mean, I, I can go find you a 24 year old right now who's incredibly talented, but that doesn't mean they're worth a crap. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, can you get on stage? Can you capture a stranger's attention? And then can you hold it for an hour? That's not something anybody does out of the gate. I mean, I guess, unless you're Prince, you know, every now and again, well, somebody let's shows face up it, Prince, man, you know. Yeah, yeah, so every now and again, someone's fully formed. But you know, Michael Jordan needed Phil Jackson. You know, the Beatles needed George Martin. Like, Tom Brady, he, you know, yeah, I go, well, I guess he got one ring without Bill Belichick, but you know, that system works no matter who you are, no matter how great you are at something, having someone who's not in the middle of it with you, but watching it from outside, who has all the knowledge and insight, you know, you need that coach. Um, and it's funny you mentioned that, that podcast, because you know, when podcasts first took off, so many of them, you could you could tell which podcasters started getting coaching and lessons from radio people and which ones didn't, because there was this cross section of that guy's great at radio but terrible at podcasting and vice versa. And somewhere in the middle of the free flowing conversation, the ones who really excelled were the ones who got some real radio coaching. So the fundamentals still apply. You can just not worry about commercial breaks. You don't have to worry about cussing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can get way more personal. Excuse me, you can get way more personal, but at the end of the day, you still have to have the chops. And, um, you know, the podcasts that, that succeed, uh, I do think, are a, are a bit of a hybrid, from certainly from where they were 10 years ago. Steve Gorman from Steve Gorman Rocks on the line with me right now. We've got more information about him over at KGGO.com. Also, SteveGormanRocks.com. Uh, for all the latest on what's happening on the show, uh, let's talk about the show now. Uh, I do want to hit sports with you because... I, I just want to talk sports with Steve Gorman, but the show, Steve Gorman Rocks, what do we get when we listen to this show? Well, I, well, first and foremost, at least to me, is you get five hours of great music. And, you know, the, it's an interesting thing in classic rock radio. You want to, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, but you want to put a new coat of paint on it. You know what I mean? With every new show in that realm. It's a syndicated show and we're in a lot of markets. And so we go deep on playlists. But we don't go to like B sides. You know what I mean? We'll go yeah. to, we'll go to side two of the album, but we're not going to give you the outtake that the band didn't want on the record back in the day. So we go deep, but it's not like an indie station that's just trying to confuse you. We're playing music people lo know and love, and within that, April Rose, my co-host and I, we have a lot of funny stories. We 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 do have great interviews. I got stories about so many artists that I've either worked with directly or that I know personally 
or that I've heard directly from the the source, just funny stories backstage, in the studio, on stage, whatever they are. So there's so many things, you know, and if I, I, I like to tell the story of a lot of songs, like the origin story of a song, uh, good, bad, and ugly, or and everything in between. Having spent as much time as I did in a band that was famously dysfunctional and famously great on occasion, and you know, we, we wandered off into the weeds, we came back better than ever. You know, we had a real roller coaster ride. I've been around a lot of bands, and you know, you can kind of. I always say bands are like groups of dogs. You can sniff each other and make a decision in about three seconds. Are we going to get along? Do I get these guys? Do I yeah. know where they're coming from? And it really is like that. Like every band I've ever been around, it's it. They're all. It's a clown car. You know what I mean? That <laughs> they make. You know, I love rock music. It's my life. I love rock music, and I respect the product. But to really understand rock and roll music, you have to have a pretty bleak sense of humor about the clowns producing yeah. that wonderful music. Because, you know, you get a bunch of, especially you get a bunch of guys in their young 20s and give them some success and to go along with already some talent. And you're just asking for a fireworks show. And that's what most bands turn into. And even when I lived through one and had some really difficult times, I always was struck by, this is the craziest I would never believe this book if I read it myself. And and I used to say I'd write a book, but nobody would believe it. And then I actually did write a book, and people are like, this is crazy. And I'm like, I'm barely scratching the surface, but that's every rock band. Steve Corbin, you're a liar. There's no way this happened. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Steve that's Gorman. right. I, I, I got that a lot, and I was like, sorry. I mean, we'll see who sues me, and so far nobody has. Did you have one editor that like looked over part of it and was like, really? Come on. No, I, the only thing we, um, I, the book that I wrote was about three times longer than what was published. And it wasn't, it was mostly the, uh, a, a, a writer, a music writer, a buddy of mine, Stephen Hyde, and I asked him to, to play that part for me. I said, look, I'm going to go write this thing, but you got to help me shape it and just tell me when it's too much. And, and the, the one thing he was able to do was say, you know, these stories, you got these, like he would say this, he would name five events from the book. He go, they're all hilarious. They're all well-written. They're all tragic, whatever they were. He goes, but ultimately they're telling the same story. It's a different situation, but you're establishing who people are or who you are. And you've already done that. Like it, it's, it's a new set of details, but it's kind of, you're hitting people over the head with something they already understand about yourself or about one of the other guys. And that was really helpful. You know, I knew I needed somebody not, you know, because when I started writing it, I just went into a tunnel for a year and I just relived and walked myself right through, you know, 27 years of my life um, uh, for, for better or worse. And so it was very important to me at that time. I was like, you know, I turned in like a 950 page book and the, the publisher, when I first sent it in, he was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and I was like, I said, read it he goes i'm not no. printing war and peace. like <laughs> he goes do you think so? he goes do you? it was funny because at first i was very protective of it of course and i was like no man this is gold trust me and he said do you know how much it costs to publish a 950 page book and do you know how much we have to charge and i literally was like oh yeah no that never occurred to me <laughs> it's <laughs> called like, a sequel think, steve come on <laughs> yeah I, I don't i don't think we want to uh, i don't think we want to publish a book that we have to charge 97 dollars for i can't just imagine you like hitting the uh top of the car like i'm telling you this is it man this is that's well great. and then someone else said someone else said so it's your first book and you're gonna just release it it's a four album box set out of the gate you might want to <laughs> rethink that one Steve Gorman on the line with me right now, just chatting about everything under the sun. You were talking about uh, the playlist that you guys bring to Steve Gorman Rocks, and I think, and I'm kind of at an interesting age where I think classic rock is going to be really interesting here over the next couple of years, because you have different areas within classic rock. What, what do you think of the world of classic rock right now? You know, everything from, I do look at some bands and think, um, why are you still doing this? You know, I, I hear the Rolling Stones are putting a new record, and I'm really excited. You know, I'm yeah. like, I don't think they, I don't think they'd be doing that if it weren't, if they didn't have ideas they genuinely liked. Um, classic rock to me, it, I, I only use the term classic rock in terms of a radio format, but in terms of rock music in general, there are great bands. Uh, there are 
phenomenal young bands out there playing great rock music. Now, rock music's never going to have that corner of the cultural conversation like it did for the 60s and 70s and through the 80s. And then into the first part of the 90s, I think by the end of the 90s, rock music had peaked. There was this apex early 90s. I just read this list the other day, like the Use Your Illusion albums, the Metallica Black album, Pearl Jam 10, Nirvana Nevermind, Soundgarden, one of their albums, and Blood Sugar Sex Magic. All those records were released within six weeks of each other. Yeah, they in were. In 1991. Worth yeah. Those are all records that sold 10 million copies. Everything, every one of those records sold 10 million copies, and they all came out in the, in a month and a half. I think it's safe to say that was the apex of rock music. <laughs> but 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 the but the downhill side of the apex goes a lot faster than the uphill climb. And by the end of the decade, you know, with what people were calling new metal and rap rock hybrids and just country music taking over where a lot of rock and roll fans felt left out. You know, things really changed. At the end of the day, there's still great rock. There's still great rock and roll bands, young bands making music. They're never going to have a chance to be such a cultural, uh, to be so important culturally speaking. Yeah. But to people who are just interested in the music, if you're just a music fan and you don't really care about seeing your your favorite songwriters, you know, on the cover of magazines that people still read. It's a great time to be a rock and roll fan. There's tons of great music. You just got to work a little harder to find it. But man, it's absolutely out there. How? What is the? And I, I don't want to like put you in a pigeonhole you with this, but like, what's the range of music you get to on Steve Gorman rocks? We go from um, the the music we play from the '60s. Now that's becoming more and more limited. Like the late '60s, we still play Hendrix and the Doors, the mm-hmm. first two Led Zeppelin records, which came out in '69, of course. Um, Deep Purple sabbath uh, there's a lot i mean but when i start naming them it sounds like a lot but the bulk of the show i think the sweet spot right now and it does shift over time but mid 70s to mid 80s is really the sort of i think with the age of the audience and, and we, we do have a an audience that skews a little younger than a lot of classic rock shows because we also add music now up into the mid 90s you yeah. know like the 25 to 30 year mark is when you start thinking something fits in classic rock I don't think we have anything that we played later than like 97 or 98, okay. but we do have stuff that's, you know, we're edging towards 2000. We'll get there soon enough. Um, that's what I'm saying. I, I would say the, I think the bulk of the show is uh, coincidentally my middle school, high school and college years, you know, so, uh, but that's just kind of where the format is and where our listeners tell us they want to hear. But, you know, we like I said, we'll, we'll still play dazed and confused and we'll play a Foo Fighters song at the same time. I had a great conversation with a guy, he called it, we do a vinyl show on the weekends where we just play an entire album, right? And uh, we were great. playing uh, Green Day and this guy calls in, you can't play that, blah blah blah, just on and on and on and I said, dude, the, that album is almost 25 years old or you know, whatever happened. He goes, really? Yeah. And I go, yeah, and he goes, oh, well hell, play it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Where it's no, just, it's, um, I, I mean, it's just an interesting so world first, right now. So Yeah, my first album is 33 years old. And when someone says something to me about, oh, this is 20 years ago, in my brain, that means 1989. I'm like, <laughs> oh, no, wait, sorry. That's 34 years ago. Like, I'm still not caught up in my, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 58 years old, but I still see the world like I did when I was in my early 40s, I think. Like, I, I at some point, I just stopped. Because I will read things constantly about 30 years since this and 25 years since that, and I and I have to remind myself what that actually means. See, I'm 42, so I'm at that interesting age where I'm starting to see some of that stuff that I remember as a kid is now 20 years ago. It's a different oh, yeah. way of looking yeah. at things, you know? And the weirdest thing, too, is like my first album, the Black Rose first album came out in 90, in February of 1990, and that was 18 years after, like, say, the Stones released Exile on Main Street. That's all. It was... It was 21 years after Led Zeppelin won. 21 years now in my life is the, not the blink of an <laughs> eye, but it's pretty darn close. And so, you know, in 1990, looking back at 1969, you know, from the age of four to the age of 25, that's huge. It's forever. And I yeah. thought Led Zeppelin are, they're ancient, they're dinosaurs. We went out and opened for Robert Plant that year. He was 42 years old and we would sit around and go, can you believe how good he looks? He's still doing it. That's amazing. Like. <laughs> We were talking about him like he was Mr. Burns from The Simpsons. Yeah. 
Oh, we because had that. Because he was 42. And how could a 42-year-old still do that? Well, we were talking about that with Atlas. Uh, we, we had him just in town, and we were talking about it off the air. That dude is yeah. in his 70s, and that was maybe one of the best rock shows I've ever seen. He's got it. I just interviewed him. We did a Zoom call a couple of weeks ago, and I've, I've you know, talked with him a, a few times over the years, and we got off the phone. I probably spent 30 minutes with him, and I was like, that guy is not, that's the same guy I met in 1993. Yeah. Like, he, he, I thought he was really old then, and now I think he looks really good for his age now. But in between, <laughs> still the con- a consummate pro, great performer, great entertainer, great storyteller. He's just the best. Steve Gorman from Steve Gorman Rocks on the line with me right now. We'll have all the information at the website for you. Hey, Steve, as we do wrap up this week, because I know I don't want to take up too much of your time today. I know you're a busy guy. But um, sports, what's the biggest story in the sporting world right now? Oh, come on, man. It's Dion, <laughs> Colorado. Yeah? Of course. What did you think of that game this weekend? Well, I sadly was not able to see it. I was at a beautiful cabin on Lake Superior off the grid for a couple of days for a long weekend. And then, of course, went into town, looked at my phone, and, the, and, and it was happening. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm missing this. What is wrong with me? I, I certainly watched all the highlights, and I kept up with it after the fact. That... Uh, but I think it's great. Look, I was in Atlanta for the 90s, so when Dion was playing for the Falcons and the Braves, he just owned that city. And yeah. I get why a lot of people were turned off. You know, just that brash cockiness. It doesn't work for a lot of folks. But the first time I went to see him play for the Falcons, he took up the first quarter of the game. He gets a punt, takes it back 70 yards for the touchdown. He's in his second or third NFL game. They wave it back with a penalty. They run the play again. And then he walks out to receive the punt again. And he's yelling at the crowd, pumping his arms like, come on, let me hear it. <laughs> the crowd all cheers the second time, almost to like as, a, as it's funny. And then he does it again from 80 yards. He did, did it two straight plays, ran right through and around and passed an entire defense on special teams. He did it two times in less than two minutes. And I walked out of the stadium and went, I've never seen anything like that guy. And then the next time I saw him live, he hit a leadoff triple <laughs> for the Braves oh, wow. standing up and, and we were saying he should have tried for the Inter Park home run I mean he's just an absolutely you know th- this is a guy who played in a National League Championship Series baseball game and an NFL game on the same day did he, you know that? He's amazing and like you were saying the, the cockiness and all that just being a loud mouth I, every time I see him talk I want to I want to go that route but then I'm like man I like this guy too much he was having a no, bunch the, of interviews this weekend uh, before the game, yeah. and it's like, oh, 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 I want to hate you, but I can't. You're so awesome. <laughs> hey, man, if, if uh, hell, I don't know, if Stephen Hawking had spent 20 years reminding us that he's smarter than everybody else on planet Earth, at a certain point you go, yeah, well, he's right. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, hey, good <laughs> on you, man. You, you, you want us Einstein. With, with Dion, the answer was always, I, I just always felt like he's just seeing games at a level that the average guy, even the average other major league or NFL player, can't imagine. He's, yeah. he's just truly that guy. So the only way to – can you imagine how fast his mind is working at all times? If the Braves had won the 92 World Series – now here I go with my October ulcer from the Atlanta Braves of the 90s. <laughs> but if the Braves – if they had won that series against Toronto – he would have been the series MVP. Yeah. No, I mean, no I mean by, by, by a long margin, he hit 500 for the series. Think about this. He would have been the World Series MVP in the middle of an NFL season while he was playing every Sunday. That is astounding to contemplate. And it's hard to imagine anybody doing that now. It's really true. It's, it's really true. It's not like a guy being in two great rock bands at the same time. It's like a guy being in a great rock band and then also happens to be, uh, not even jazz, but almost like a great polka accordionist. or Something some, completely I mean, some, different, I, yeah. Yeah, I don't know because, because this, you know, it's one thing to be really good at those two sports, but to be the best arguably at your position in two sports concurrently, you know, he and Bo Jackson are just, that, those are just guys that are just, that, there's not been anybody like that since. And, and I don't know that there ever will be again. I mean, I don't think there ever will be again because now that everyone's so specialized, no no team would allow one of their star players to play another sport. But it was pretty amazing while it's happening. So all this to say, 
of course I'm not surprised that his son happens to be a ridiculous quarterback. You, you know, know what, what I mean? Like, no, he was great, and he was a lot of fun to watch. That game, just in general, was a great college football game to watch. But I'm yeah. wondering what it's going to be like this week because now somebody has tape on what Colorado looks like because that was a brand-new team coming in. Uh, for all we knew, they could have ran a triple option when they came in. We didn't. You know, you don't know what to yeah. prepare for. So now no, I'm, that's true. I'm, I'm, I want to see if it was just, it is what it is, and here we are. And, and uh, what they say about TCU, like a good chunk of their offense was all brand new as well, including their quarterback. So well, maybe they're yeah, not what, no. what we De- thought. Definitely, definitely no idea to know how good they were. And I don't care who you are. Last time we saw TCU, they were being dragged up and down the field in the national title game by the Georgia Bulldogs like they were a junior varsity football team. <laughs> so I'm sorry, man, that, that's, that's a long lasting hangover. I don't care how good your coaches are at getting your head turned around. Those guys were on TV for the first time since the world saw them get fleeced. And, and I think in the back of their heads, once things didn't go as planned, I think they were just out of there. I think they were losing it. And I, I don't, I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, I have a 23 year old son. I, I, I those kids are in their teens and early twenties, man. They are not, they are not fully developed human beings yet. Trust I've, me. I forgot how bad that game was. I had to look it up real quick. Sixty-five Dude, to seven. By six, yeah, I was going to say Georgia beat them by like six hundred points. It oh was my terrible! God. I forgot about it. And, and, <laughs> and TCU, you know, the thing that kills me is TCU beat Michigan to get there. Yeah, Michigan played the worst game of the year, I, and I'm a. I'm a Michigan fan just because my I, I was born there, but I moved as a baby. But my older brothers, it just was the house I grew up in. No good reason to still cheer for Michigan, except that it's my lifelong thing. And I hear that fight song and I get excited like I even care. But but so I'm still cheering for Michigan. Um, and and they just they made so many mistakes in TC. But for TCU, that was like their that was their championship game. They proved to the world that they belonged in the final four. Yeah, by beating Michigan, but then oh my gosh, and then Georgia. You know, if you remember, Ohio State should have won that game. Ohio oh yeah, State had Georgia beat, and Georgia. You can't if you let Georgia escape the way Ohio State did. They're gonna kill anybody they play next. The TCU man, it was a, <laughs> it was a, it was a, it was a, it was, a, it was an incredible beatdown. Uh, real quick, since you brought up Michigan and been watching them, uh, Iowa received, got uh, Cade McNamara through the uh, transfer portal. Uh, is that a good thing right. for Iowa, or do I have to worry about him being hurt after every single play? He, he's a little little fragile, but he's a good player. He's a smart player, and for a quarterback, that's job one, is get a guy that, you know, that's got a good head on his shoulders. Um, I, think he'll be, I think he'll be very good for you. I'm still... I mean, just truth be told, though, I'm still pissed off about that Chuck Long game in 1985. So <laughs> if you want to, uh, you know, I, I, that that Hayden Fry, that mustache, that I'm still haunted by that. So, you know, we can we can go back with Hawkeye Wolverine football all you want. There's a really interesting relationship between Iowa and Michigan. That's one of those rivalries that it's kind of ri- a rivalry without being a rivalry, I feel like. I don't know why. Yeah, I think they've, well, they've had a, a lot of games that mattered that nobody knew would matter until the moment it happened. Yeah. You know, it seems like, seems like both those teams, their seasons turn up or down after that game. Like, there seems to always be these stakes nobody saw coming. I've, I've said that same thing for years. One of my best friends from college is an Iowa guy. He's from Clinton, Iowa. And, um, and he's a Hawkeye lifer. And back in the '80s, we were watching that game together, and we've always talked about it every year since. And we're always saying, like, you know, every two, three years, we're like, this game shouldn't matter, but it does. It's always, it's always the team, one of the two teams. You know, you can look back at that game and say that's when it all went right, or that's yeah. when it all went wrong from then on. No, it's it's just one of those interesting relationships. They almost need to do some sports show about that, like. Not the real pure rivalries, but those interesting relationship games. Because I think there are more right. of those uh, well, out there. I tell you what, I tell you what, that's a great idea. Let's you and me do that. Like, let's just let's just get on the phone like around midnight one night. We'll have a couple cocktails <laughs> and we'll just make up stats about Michigan, Iowa, and see if anyone calls us on it. We can do that. We'll fill the hours by uh, BSing about some sports. We'll be sort of right and kind of <laughs> factual. It'll be perfect. Steve Gorbin from Steve Gorbin Rocks on the line with me. Uh, Steve, welcome to the station. We appreciate you. Can't wait to uh, have you guys down here, you and April. 
and uh, have a great show, okay? I'm, hey, man, I'm, I'm thrilled to be in Des Moines, and I'll tell you right now, I got a new band called Bagmen, and we're just starting to play out. We got a few songs up online, and we are, by God, going to be in Des Moines as soon as possible, especially now that I'm on the air with you guys. I want to come down there and play a gig, so we're going to make it happen sooner than later. Look forward to it, Steve. Well, uh, you know what? I'll put that uh, information up on the website as well, okay? Beautiful. Thank uh, you. 